It was good, everybody. It was who was like God. And I'm back with a video about some interesting things that I've been thinking about regarding Christ. A little couple of little doodads that I wanted to accumulate and put into a quick video, especially because I'm going to be going away for a little bit. So I wanted to drop something that was uh, pretty substantial instead of just YouTube shorts until I'm back home. And this one simply called interesting things about Christ starting with when the devil was tempting Christ in the wilderness because there's a lot of depth there that most people miss including myself but I believe when we peel back the surface we can see how interconnected the Bible truly is and it speaks to God's wisdom and his knowledge and his foresight and everything like that so first we're going to talk about how Christ was tempted by the devil and how Christ parallels the great prophet Moses from the Old Testament all right so Basically, the long and short of it is when the devil was being tempted in the wilderness, or excuse me, when Christ was being tempted in the wilderness by the devil, he was being offered things that were technically already his, things that were already his, that the devil was trying to offer and get Christ to take by taking the easy way and by selling his soul, essentially. All right, so Matthew 4, verses 3 to 11, the whole story of when Christ was... um. The whole narrative on Christ was being tempted by the devil in Matthew. Matthew uh, Matthew 4, verses 3 to 11. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Let me, or, let me try to orient my, my, my angle here. All right. All right. Verse 4. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So, after the first temptation, Christ quotes Deuteronomy, and he upholds the truth that the spiritual truth, God's word, is needed just as much as the physical stuff. You know, physical provision, bread, food, resources. God's spiritual truth, God's revelation to us is just as important uh, and I would argue even more important in terms of eternity's sake. But so that is what Christ is saying. And that comes full circle later on because of the importance of the written Bible is, is plays a big role in this whole scene. Because what the devil proves, and I've said this before on my channel, is that he knows the written Bible enough to try to twist it and to try to corrupt it. I made two YouTube shorts about this. The devil, the same Bible which mentions the devil and Satan and everything like that. The same Bible that mentions him, the devil knows enough to try to take scriptures out of context and to try to twist them to get people to stumble. He tried this with Christ himself and his ministry. And every time the devil twisted a scripture, Christ responded with another scripture. Interestingly, every time the devil would try to twist a scripture, sort of like how he sort of twisted God's words in Eden, um... Out of context, Christ would reply with something in context, a principle in context that is timeless. The set, now we get to the second uh, temptation where the devil is trying to get Jesus to jump off of the temple. And he actually quotes Psalm 91 to assure Jesus that should he jump off of the temple, off of the roof of the temple, basically, God will send down his angels and he will protect you because you're his servant that he anointed. He's not going to let you die. So the devil is trying to get Jesus to do this. And sometimes we think about why would have this been tempting? Well, I think there's two reasons why this could have been tempting to Jesus, because um, not only by doing this would Christ have full reassurance in God's calling for him, right? Because God is sending all these divine angels to protect you. So not only would, have, would it have reaffirmed God's anointing, genuine anointing on him, but it also would have revealed to all the tribes of Israel that he was the son of God, that he was this divine agent, that he was this Messiah, because um the temple it was a public place so when if Christ were to jump off and all these angels rushed down and carried him down safely everyone would have seen and would have known that the time has come so what's going on in the second temptation is the devil 
is essentially offering Christ what rightfully belongs to him in terms of the tribes of Israel, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, things that are promised to the Messiah in the Old Testament. Again, both the devil and Christ know the Old Testament. The devil knows it enough to twist it. And he's trying to get Christ to do these things that'll give him glory in the short term. But in the long term, he'd be sinning. He'd be uh, transgressing God's covenant and, and disrespecting God. In this case, if he were to actually do what the devil suggested, he would have been putting God to the test. So instead of going through with it, Christ doesn't put God to the test and he goes through with God's plan and how he is supposed to get these things. God's plan of how Christ is supposed to get vindicated is through his suffering and his death and his resurrection. By the resurrection, Christ would be vindicated. And that's when um, everything will be given to him. So from that perspective, the devil knows that and he's trying to get the devil, the devil's trying to get Christ um, to sell his soul and his ministry to get these things by bowing down to him instead. The devil, the book of Ephesians calls the devil the prince of the power of the ear. We know in the Bible that there are spiritual, that spiritual entities are associated with different territories. Cosmic geography is what some folks call it. But the, the, the overall chief, the main rebel is the saint, is the adversary, is the devil as he's called in the New Testament. And the devil who has this authority on the earth. Now, don't get it twisted because God is the ultimate king, right? So the devil isn't this all-powerful being, right? But the devil does have legitimate power over the unbelieving world. And um, right now, well, especially in Jesus' time, you have the world worshiping idols and false gods. So what the devil promises in the third temptation is world unity in Christ at the cost of Christ forsaking his God, Yahweh, and worshiping the devil instead. So you have all these world, all these nations worshiping false gods. We know the Old Testament predicts them worshiping the one true God. And the Old Testament also promises unity in the Messiah. So what the devil's trying to do is to say, all right, I promise the whole world will come and worship you. But you're going to be worshiping me instead. You're not going to be worshiping the Most High. And this is at this point where Christ actually says, be gone, Satan. Because he knows the Old Testament is very clear that the only God that deserves worship is the Most High, the Most High of the Bible, so to speak. So it's at this temptation that Christ directly tells the devil to be gone. And the devil actually leaves him until he tries to come back later on in the ministry with the whole hour of darkness, the crucifixion and suffering. But how God used that in rose Christ. All right. So here's the thing. Christ was the Messiah. He was a Hebrew who was descended from David. And even today, we can look at the effect Christ would have, things he did in his ministry and the way he affected the world. And even if we don't presuppose that he's the Messiah or that he resurrected or that the miracles he did, meaning I obviously I believe all of these things. But even if we put that on the side and we just look historically, the things Christ did and the way he affected the world, and we put that against the Old Testament backdrop, we see a lot of amazing things. There's a lot of objective prophecies from the Old Testament that are fulfilled without presupposing Christ is the Messiah in the first place. We look at this individual, this Hebrew, again, descended from David, the house of David, the way he affected the entire world. And we can even start to calculate the odds of an individual doing that on a, gener on a generous basis, saying, let's say one in a hundred did this aspect of Christ's ministry, or one in a thousand did this aspect of Christ's ministry. And when we put all these things together, and then we look at outside of Christ's ministry, the way one person, one Hebrew man would affect the entire world and royal kings, King Azana, these royal African kings, like I've mentioned before, th this whole thing, then it really is against all odds. That's the thing about it. Greater than 100 quadrillion odds are the odds that Christ uh, perfectly fulfilled on a merely historical, objective level. All right, so that's something that I wanted to throw out and make a point in this video regarding. We can look and we can see Christ's effect, even if you're not a believer. Just looking at the world and smelling the roses as to Yeshua and the way he affected the earth as we know it and human society as we know it. All right, so to that effect, the devil has, the devil, excuse me, the Bible has these prophecies about the Messiah and about how he's going to be the king of Israel and about how he's going to be the king of the world for that matter. Isaiah 11 verses 11 to 12 it's speaking that in the days of the messiah god quote will extend his hand yet a second time to recover at the remnant that remains of his people from assyria from egypt from pathros from cush from alam from shinar from hamath 
and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel. So in the Messiah, God or the Messiah himself is going to have this great event of all the tribes of Israel in the Israelite diaspora being um, reunited, reunited in the rule of Jesse because David's dad was named Jesse. So the Messiah is the one who's called descended from Jesse in Isaiah 11. It's going to be in him and through him and in the days through this um, revelation of this Messiah that God is going to bring all these tribes back in. So the Messiah is going to rule over the tribes of Israel. And then Zechariah 9 verse 10, speaking of the Messiah, the prophet says, and he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river, the Euphrates, to the ends of the earth. Excuse me. So here Zechariah directly promises that the rule of the Messiah is going to be global. And we get this in other places, too. It's not just Zechariah. There's some Psalms that talk about this royal king of David that everybody's looking for. His rule is going to be beyond just Israel. So what does this mean? Because this is where it gets deep. The Old Testament promises that the tribes belong to the Messiah or the tribes belong to the Christ. And so does the known world. This is the one individual in God's plan who has the right to rule the nation. So what the devil is promising Christ in the second and third temptation are things that already belongs to him, scripturally speaking, the tribes of Israel and the nations as a whole. But the devil is trying to get Christ to get them by selling his soul, by breaking God's commandments and by worshiping the devil instead. Christ, these things would have been tempting because in the short term, everyone would have accepted Christ right then and his ministry would have been in some sense, it would have been vindicated, but at what cost when you're rejecting the Most High? So when we look at what, how Christ rebukes that and he follows with God's plan, we could see how um, Christ would get these things. He would be vindicated. And we can look at interesting ways Christ was vindicated, both from a Hebraic perspective, Hebrew perspective, and from a African perspective, and from a resurrection perspective. And so Christ would get these things, but it would be through his suffering and his death. He would be rejected by the tribes, many of the tribes of his nation, by the Pharisees, by the high priest. He would be rejected by them instead of being accepted all at once. You know, so it, it, when you put these things together, everybody loves you right now or they're going to hate you. But what God called you to do is to be hated. That's what's going to happen in your ministry. Many people are going to reject it, but kings later on are going to come and honor you as happened with Christ. So Christ stays faithful to God's calling, to God's anointing, God's way of how Christ would get the tribes and the nations and be exalted, which is through suffering and death. And we can look and see how later on kings would come and honor Christ voluntarily weighing the gospel and believing it, which is God's vindication of his ministry. Again, Isaiah 49 7. proves that the devil knows the Bible. He knows the Bible to trust it. And he knows what already belongs to Jesus and he wants to get Jesus to achieve those things. He's tempting Jesus to Get what already belongs to him by following the devil. The devil knows the Bible, but so does Christ, meaning Christ knows Isaiah 53. Christ knows the mission he is sent on from God, and he knows that the means of achieving these things is going to be through his suffering and ultimately from his resurrection. Now, what's amazing about his mission, his mission of suffering is something that the apostles didn't originally understand or even initially believe until they had seen the risen Jesus uh, multiple times after the crucifixion and after the death. So the apostles, in some sense, missed the movement. They were followed, the very followers of Christ, the disciples of Christ who knew him personally, did not fully understand the ministry of dying and suffering for the nation and for the world until after Christ had um, resurrected. And then the, 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 the ministry that was promoted by the Old Testament, it became clear to them. See, if you look at the Old Testament, you see that when Jesus talks about how he's going to be handed over and killed, the apostles don't understand and they're afraid to understand. Only after the resurrection and after the belief in Christ that he rose, does Isaiah 53 get applied to Christ by the apostles. Meaning, they believed that he resurrected first before they ever went back of the Old Testament and used prophecies and said, whoa, we're living in prophetic times. These words spoken by Isaiah have been fulfilled by Jesus. They believe in the resurrection first before they go and look at these prophecies in the Old Testament, which is something that I'd argue and I bet 
most biblical scholars, most uh, historical Jesus scholars will give you. All right. But putting that aside, Christ is the only one who actually alludes to Isaiah 53 in his ministry. Other people don't know what's going on. They don't fully understand this thing about suffering for the sins until after the fact. Christ is the only one who is fully cognizant of what he's going to do, how he's going to suffer for sins in the Gospels. So, in other words, Christ, he stays faithful to God's purposes, and he is rejected by many Hebrews and many people in the first century, Greeks and Romans, but in every measurable way that us in the 21st century can look at, he was vindicated by the Father himself. All right, so that's something about the, the temptations of Christ and how they're very real, because we know what the devil was trying to tempt Christ to get, again, what already belonged to him. Hebrews chapter 3 verses 1 to 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who is faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus had been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. In other words, the things that these eyewitnesses of Christ are seeing firsthand. But Christ is faithful over all God's house, over God's house as a son. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. So in other words... If you look at God's house, the Old Testament says that Moses was a faithful servant in all God's house. Then the New Testament comes along, the eyewitnesses of Jesus, and they say Christ was the son who was operating in God's house. So Christ gets a level of glory that's even higher than Moses. And I want to set that up because if you compare Moses and Jesus, something that I've been meaning to get to a long time but didn't know how to incorporate it onto the channel, we can see a lot of interesting ways in which Christ is the new Moses. Um, first of all, look at Moses when he steps on the scene. He was anointed by God at a time when 400 years of Hebrew slavery had been going on in Egypt. So who was a descendant of Ham? So Egypt, descendant of Ham, the Hebrews were enslaved for 400 years. It's after this time that Moses comes and is anointed by God to uh, leave the people, lead the people out of Egypt. And this comes from a series of miracles and things that shows how God is the most high compared to all the Egyptian gods. We did a video about this as well. So that's Moses. Same way, 400 years between Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, to the days of Christ, John the Baptist, and Jesus, there's 400 years. 400 years. So in the same way, there's this 400 year gap before a prophet is anointed by God to deliver his people. This is something just that's just historical facts of the human history timeline. All right? Even if you don't want to look at the New Testament, we just look at the time of Moses when he came in the story and the time of Christ compared to when Malachi, the last prophet of Israel, spoke. And that's significant because in this 400 years of Jewish history, of Hebrew history, we can look and we can see times where God was definitely with them, like with the Maccabean revolt. But God had not come and made his will crystal clear through a prophet or an anointed one. So it was like the days of Samuel, First Samuel 3, 1, where God was not directly appearing through visions or words of prophecy that were uh, through the mouths of prophets. I mean, biblical prophets that were making God's will clear to the nation. All right. But it's after this period that Christ, well, first of all, John the Baptist, who the Israelite community as a whole believed was a man of God. That's from Josephus Antiquities. It'd be 400 years before John the Baptist comes and John the Baptist pointed the way to Christ, who was the Messiah. All right. And according to the New Testament, Moses fled. Um, Moses was in exile for 40 days after he killed the Egyptian slave master. He ran away for 40 days. And this is when God appeared to him in the burning bush. And then this is when he was anointed on his task to go and save the Israelites. So 40 days is when Moses um, comes, comes on the scene to actually start doing what he's doing. In the same way, it'd be 40 days in the wilderness before Christ starts his public ministry and everything. Like that's so both Moses and Christ have the 400 years and both Moses and Christ have the 40 days. And uh, another thing about Christ is when Christ is in the wilderness, he's completing the wilderness test that the 
wilderness generation failed. Think about it when the ancient Israelites, the old saints, were in the wilderness. They built the golden calf, and they just were characterized by faithlessness. They had seen the miracles, but they kept doubting their God and their ability, and they kept um, being really, they were really pestering God, you know. So the faithlessness of the wilderness generation, which caused them to wander for 40 years, Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days, and he completely uh, won the test. Not only did he never forsake the commandments of God in the Torah, he never put God to the test. He didn't worship the devil. He didn't go astray. He, so he stayed faithful and he rejected idolatry. So we can compare and look and see that Christ, in some sense, is the new Israel. Christ won the test. He completed the test. He passed the test that his ancestors failed all those years ago in the wilderness generation. What I wanted to do here was to talk about some really interesting things about Christ uh, that some people have talked about but aren't necessarily on the forefront. So with the platform that I have and the, the people that view that I'm grateful that watch and check out my videos, I wanted to present some cool stuff about Christ, both how when the devil was tempting Christ, there's some real deep layers to that, and how when we look at Christ and Moses, the great prophet, there's a lot of interesting layers there, both the 400 years when they arrived and the 40-day ministry or the 40-day period before both of them, um, you know, directly, actively were doing what God called them to do. You know, so there's a lot of interesting parallels. There's a lot of interesting things that point to Christ from a unique perspective. So I wanted to take some time to shout that out. And while I'm here, I want to shout out Inspiring Philosophy. He did a video called Why I'm Not a Christian Nationalist. Inspiring Philosophy did this video, which is where I first heard um, about this whole thing about the devil and Christ in the wilderness. And I started thinking about it in a perspective that I never have before. So I praise God for that. So all that being said, uh, that's my video for today. The next video, God willing, if y'all could see this up here, maybe I can. It's the prophecy of Isaiah 53. Next video is going to be, again, God willing, locking into Isaiah 53 and just analyzing it from an objective perspective. Because so everybody got opinions about Isaiah 53. And here I'm just going to be objective, not coming in with any presuppositions. And just going in with a clean slate and seeing the interesting things we can find with Isaiah 53. Um, so I'm excited to do that. I've had a couple of videos, but I'm excited to dive back into the prophecy because I would say over the last year, uh, looking into different things and hearing different things, there's a lot of things from Old Testament culture and ancient Israelite culture and all these different things that, that shed light on Isaiah 53. In really interesting ways. So I want to bring that to the forefront. And sort of revitalize prophecy in a sense. Not that it's me doing it, but God. All that to say that there's some people who don't think that Isaiah 53 is a real prophecy or whatever. Well, I'm going to show you if we if we just look at it and we understand everything in context. There is every reason to look at it and then to look later on to see if any Hebrew, especially one descended from David, went and fulfilled these things. And when we go from that perspective that is brought up from the Old Testament, then we can see a lot of interesting things that point to Christ and the world. Again, without reading Isaiah 53, already believing Jesus is who he said he is, coming in with that presupposition, we can see a lot of interesting things in the way he affected the world. Just this Hebrew descended from David and the global impact he would have. So if that gets you excited, whether you're um, a believer already or you're not, I pray Yahweh check that out because I think it'll. I pray it'll be a blessing from the Most High. But yeah, thank you all for watching this video. I plan this to be like six, seven minutes, and this is like 25 minutes. Maybe it'll be a little shorter in editing. But y'all be blessing the Messiah. Y'all be blessing the Messiah. Peace out, man. I'll see you in the next one.